Mr. Speaker, sir, I rise in support of the amendments to the motion as proposed by Mr. Liang Enghua. Today we've had a long debate on this past reserves, how much to use, how much is enough. But let us not forget what a blessing it is to have the privilege of having such a debate, having past reserves to argue over. How did we get into such an enviable position? MPs will know that Singapore didn't start with much. In 1959, when the PAP government first took office, Dr. Goh Keng Sui was appointed Minister of Finance, and he immediately discovered that the Treasury was bare. And he had to implement immediate austerity measures, including pay cuts for civil servants and ministers. It was only by the early 1980s, after two decades of nation building, that we had started to accumulate a nest egg of reserves. And at that time, our forefathers considered what to do. Because they anticipated that the political pressure to spend these reserves would grow, and that if these hard-earned savings were not properly protected, they could be easily and unwisely spent. And once gone, is gone. And they felt that they had to do everything they could to guard against this. So in 1984, at the National Day Rally, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew talked about how the reserves could be frittered away by a profligate government spending money that it had not itself earned within a single term. And he proposed a simple principle. If a government wants to spend, it must first raise the money. Whether by raising taxes or by making shrewd investments or some other direct, open, proper means, but not by drawing down on the past reserves that it had inherited. And to guard against a rogue government raiding the reserves, Mr. Lee mooted the idea of a president elected directly by the people who would have the, constitu the constitutional power and the moral authority to safeguard the reserves and be able to say no if the government wanted to spend it for an unwise purpose. And that was the concept of the second key. Four years later, 1988, the PAP government published the White Paper on the Elected President Scheme. Professor Jayakuma oversaw the drafting, and I helped him with it. We made the elected president proposal a central issue in the 1988 general election. After the election, in January 1991, we amended the constitution to create the elected presidency. And Mr. Wee Kim Wee, who was then already the president, took on the new custodial powers and became the first president who wielded the second key. We designed a whole system to protect the reserves, wherever those reserves might have been. So the second key applies to the government, especially the Ministry of Finance, but also to what we call the fifth schedule entities. Fifth schedule because it's a fifth schedule attached at the back of the Constitution. And these fifth schedule entities are MAS, Damase, GIC, CPF, JTC, HDB. Why did we do this? Why did we include these six entities? MAS, because those are our official foreign reserves. The Masse, those are, are our direct investments, the GLCs, government-linked companies. GIC, it doesn't have very much money of its own, but it is the manager of the government's money of MOF's money. The CPF, which is Singaporean savings. Not really the government's money, but if you have a rogue government, this too will be at risk. 
And then JTC and HDB. Why? Because land, they own and manage land for industrial, for housing, for other uses. And land has value. And in Singapore, land is often very valuable. And therefore, we must protect our land and not allow our government to do anything with it that is a covert form of giveaway. And we discuss some possibilities today. That was how we started. Our first priority was to keep the capital sums in the reserve safe. We hadn't thought very deeply about exactly how much of the income to spend. We just took a standard accounting view that the income from the reserves would be the interest and dividends that we earned on the, our investments. And we call this net investment income, NII. And we decided that government of the day could spend 100% of the NII. But in practice, we didn't spend any of the NII because we were still running comfortable budget surpluses. Later, when Mr. Ong Teng Cheong was elected president, he questioned this rule. He asked, why do we allow ourselves to spend 100% of NII? He argued correctly that we should also set aside something for the future. Because as the years pass, as the economy grows, if your reserve amount remains constant, it gets smaller relative to the economy. And you ought to allow the reserves also to grow. So the question is, how much to provide for the future while also enabling the present generation to benefit from the reserves? There's no magic rule to this, but we arrived at a split of 50-50. And there's a certain simplicity and fairness to that, a natural division that we settled on between the president and the government. It's simple. It's intuitive. Everybody can understand it. We split the difference between now and the future. Chinang And so, in 2001, Parliament passed a constitutional amendment to protect 50% of NII and add that to the reserves. And the other 50%, the government of the day could spend. So 50% for the present, 50% for the future. Over the next decades, as we gain experience operating the safeguards, we progressively refine them. And I've been closely involved in this process, first working with Professor Jai Kuma under Prime Minister Go Chok Tong, and then later on as PM. Over time, we realized that NII, net investment income, may not be the best measure of what you should be able to spend. Because when we invest, we do not just look at income from dividends and interest. We also expect to make capital gains, which are often more important than dividend payouts. For example, if you had bought Facebook shares, I didn't, but if you had, at their IPO in 2012 at the price of 38 US dollars, yesterday you would have had their value gone up 12 times because Meta closed at 455 US dollars yesterday. But you would not have received one cent of dividends. Meta is about to pay their first dividends next month in March. So in that circumstance, can we say returns from the investment is zero? No, it's wrong. So we decided we should consider not just the interest and dividends, but also include capital gains as well. And of course, you must take into account capital losses as well. And that means spending on the basis of overall investment returns, capital gains and losses, plus in earnings, plus income, interest and dividends, instead of just investment income. 
We also studied how other institutions which had built up large endowment funds managed them, particularly U.S. Ivy League universities like Yale and Harvard. Harvard has the biggest fund, Yale has quite a big fund, but Yale had a model which was very successful and very respected. We learned how they implemented consistent spending rules, how they smoothened out the draw on funds, because from year to year the fund performance can be volatile. We must understand this. We can project 4% long-term expected returns. Next year, what will you earn? God only knows. It can be plus 10, it can be minus 10. Hopefully, after 20 years, it's something like what you projected, but really, it's volatile from year to year. And you have to find some intelligent way to smooth it out so that you can spend steadily and not be whiplashed. And I met Mr. Len Baker, who chaired the Yale Investment Committee to understand how Yale did it. He happens to be on the GIC uh, Investment Advisory Panel. So we studied them, we modelled our rules on these ideas, taking into account our political and constitutional context, which makes it much more complicated for us to implement than, say, a US university. So in 2008, we amended the constitution again to specify that the government would spend out of net investment returns, NIR, instead of net investment income, NII. But we kept the 50% rule, so the government could spend 50% of net investment returns instead of 50% of net investment income. And we call this amount, which a government can draw from the reserves and add to the annual budget to spend, the NIRC, Net Investment Return Contribution. And this is how we arrive at today's system of spending half of investment returns and saving the other half. After decades of refining and improving the system, testing it out, making sure that it worked as intended. It's important to put into context just how valuable an asset our reserves are to Singapore. As you have heard, the NIRC accounts for one-fifth of government revenue. It is around 3.5% of GDP, more than what we spend on any single ministry, more than we spend on defence, more than we spend on education, more than we spend on health. 3.5% of GDP every year. As far as the Ministry of Finance is concerned, they just sit there, it arrives. They don't have to raise taxes, they don't have to collect fees, they just have to make sure that the Masse GIC MAS is run properly, and every year you hope and you should be able to get 3.5% of GDP. How does that compare with our other revenue sources? 3.5% of GDP is about equal to corporate income tax revenues. It's 1.4 times personal income tax revenues. It's 1.3 times GST revenues. Supposing we didn't have the NRIC out of the reserves, then what would we do? You have a choice. You can double corporate income tax. You can more than double personal tax, or you can roughly double GST. So instead of 9% GST, you may be 18% or 20% GST. That is what the NIRC has enabled us to do, and that is the burden which the NRIC has taken off Singapore taxpayers. We are here today because our forefathers had the prudence to build up the reserves and the vision to anticipate the political pressures to spend them and the imagination to design the two key scheme to protect the reserves for succeeding generations. That is what stewardship means. 
But despite the constitutional protection, the pressure to draw on the reserves will still be there, especially as spending needs grow. And hence the repeated questions and demands. How much do we have? Do we have too much? Are we saving too much? Can't we save just a little bit less? If you look up the hands hard, you will know this is far from the first time this subject is being discussed. No doubt the opposition will swear they are being responsible and give many plausible reasons to draw on the reserves. Surely spending a little bit more, just a little bit more, won't break the bank. Surely it's okay to talk about the income the in or the returns and we don't touch the principle. Surely we can treat land differently from other assets. No need to price it fully. Sacrifices of the people. Once we take that mindset, we are going down a deep hole. How much is enough? To me, that's the wrong question to ask. It is a misconception. I've said it before, but it is true. It is a misconception that when it comes to our reserves, there is such a number, say, X billion dollars, that is enough. Then you have more than X billion in the reserves. We have too much. You have less than X billion in the reserves. We have too little. There is no such number because we can have no idea what the future holds, what crisis we will run into, how much we will need. When the global financial crisis came, 2008, 2009, we tapped on our past reserves for the first time. We made a resilience package, $20.5 billion, $20 billion, of which $4.9 billion was earmarked to come from past reserves. We implemented a jobs credit scheme to help employers pay CPF and to protect the jobs. We had a special risk sharing initiative to encourage banks to lend and the government would share the risk of the lending. In the end, we actually took $4 billion from the past reserves. The economy revived much faster than we expected and the government returned fully this $4 billion by the end of its term. In that crisis, we also used past reserves to guarantee deposits in commercial banks. We ring-fenced $150 billion for this purpose, and we said so that we would put aside $150 billion from the reserves to back this guarantee. It's not just words. It's got real heft behind it. Thankfully, no banks failed and we didn't have to touch the money. But it was critical that we did that and to deliver a credible guarantee to bolster confidence in our banking system and probably prevented a run and the, reserve, the, the deposits would have disappeared from our banking system, gone overseas. The banking system would have crashed. The exchange rate would have crashed. Those people who say it didn't happen, it can't happen, I say, get real. So, was $4 billion enough? The next crisis, COVID-19, when it hit us, that was on a different scale altogether. We sought the President's approval successively to draw up to $69 billion from past reserves for medical facilities, for testing, for vaccines, for support schemes and assurance packages. We saved lives, we saved livelihoods. In the end, we actually drew down about $40 billion. It's not likely that we are going to be able to put $40 billion back into the reserves anytime soon. Again, in COVID, our reserves were a tremendous advantage. It gave us confidence. It gave others 
confidence in us. We had the financial muscle to do everything we needed to do without getting heavily into debt, unlike so many other countries. The Ministry of Health could concentrate on their duties. The Ministry of Education could concentrate on their arrangements. The Ministry of National Development and MOM could look after the dorms. You do what you need to do, the resources will be forthcoming. It's a tremendous luxury. Without the reserves, would we have dared to pre-order vaccines even before they were tested and proven and produced? Would we have been able to pay seven, up to 75% of salaries in the crisis, in the job support scheme, to protect workers and to prevent companies from closing? So we spent $40 billion in the end. Is $40 billion enough? COVID will not be our last pandemic, nor our most serious one. And it is far from being the worst thing that can happen to Singapore. If we find ourselves at war, like Ukraine, how much is enough? The war is costing Ukraine 100 million US dollars a day. The country relies heavily on US and European support. The US has committed over 100 billion US dollars in humanitarian, financial, military support, and now another 60 billion dollars is being debated. The administration wants to do it. The money is desperately needed in Ukraine. Not money, but guns, weapons, everything, ammunition. Congress is making it difficult. Europe has also committed almost $100 billion so far and just committed an additional $50 billion in grants and loans over four years. With a lot of angst and debate, internal disagreement, Hungary had strong views to the contrary. Without this external funding support, Ukraine's war is over. How long more can the US and Europe sustain this support for Ukraine? Looking ahead for 50 years, can anyone promise that Singapore will enjoy another half century of peace and tranquility? Or guarantee that someone will come to our rescue if we ever find ourselves in a situation like Ukraine's? So, back to the question, for Singapore, how big a nest egg is enough? Mr. Speaker, there's no sensible answer to this question. We can never say for sure how much is enough because we don't know what kind of crisis we will fa face in the future or how our investments will fare. But that doesn't mean that we should mindless, mindlessly save every dollar we earn without regard for present needs. Instead, our mindset should be to treat past reserves as a precious resource that generations of Singaporeans have built up, starting with the pioneer generation, but continuing with the, with the Merdeka generation and with the later generations till this day. And it is a resource. How much? Doesn't matter. Whatever the amount, we put it aside as a nest egg, a rainy day fund. We draw on half the investment returns to supplement our budget every year. The rest we touch only in times of exceptional need or during crisis with special permission from the, from the President. If during one term of government we happen to accumulate a surplus, then we add to the reserves and hopefully we can maintain the nest egg and keep on growing it gradually year after year, not just for this generation, but for future ones as well. The spending rule which we've settled on and enshrined in the Constitution is 50-50. Half for now, 
half of the future. As I explained earlier, this is fair and just, and as I would like to explain now, it also happens to be the right sustainable proportion to keep the reserves in proportion with the GDP. Because let me take you through this back of the envelope. Please get your back of envelopes out so we can do this sum. Let's assume a long-term expected real return of 4%. It's roughly that. You can see it from GIC's numbers. MAS is slightly lower. The Masi is slightly higher. But let's say 4%. The 50-50 rule means we spend 2%, we save 2%. Okay? It means the reserves should grow by about 2% per year because there's no other place for the reserves to grow. Just now, Mr. Sito enumerated all the other places and explained to you why there was no money in them. Land, because it's a conversion. The budget, because it's not in the surplus. And borrowing, issuing government securities, because that's not really our money. It's borrowed, and one day it will be claimed. And foreign exchange, that's also really not our money, because people bring in money to be deposited in Singapore banks, they can bring the money out of Singapore banks any time. So just because the balance is sitting there doesn't mean you can take it home. So 50-50, 2% goes back into the reserves. The reserves will grow, all things going well, 2% per year. And our economy, all things growing well, will also grow, I hope, about 2% per year. Because my workforce is flat, my productivity, if I work very hard, I get 1.5% productivity growth a year. So to make 2%, 2.5% is already working very hard and doing quite well. In other words, on present settings, with our present policy, the reserves will be growing about 2% per year, the GDP will be growing about 2% per year, the balance is the same every year. It's not getting bigger and bigger, more and more reserves, while the GDP languishes. And so the contribution to our budget, NIRC, will be about the same every year, about 3.5%. And if you look at the last five years' budgets, all of the figures are published, you will see that it's been about 3.5% a year. It hasn't gone 3.5%, 4 5 suggesting that I've got more and more money in the kitty. It's about there. And so, if I keep on doing this, I will keep on being able to do this and spending 3.5% from the reserves every year, saving me a doubling of the GST. I think that's a good thing. And that is the way to protect our nest egg. It's the right thing to do. Yes, Singaporeans are facing higher cost of living. Yes, our spending needs have gone up. And we need more programs to cater and to look after an aging population. And yes, the government does have many programs to help Singaporeans to cope with the cost of living, all kinds of them. Just now, uh, the Leader of the House let me count the ways. I don't have to count them again, but there are many. And in fact, we have covered not just the present generation and the younger generation, but also the older generations too, because we had the Pioneer Package, we had the Madula Package. We have not forgotten the people who brought us here. But each generation must spend within our means, and each generation has been able to spend within our means, and even this generation, we can spend within our means. It does mean that from time to time we have to revise our taxes, raise some of them, like the GST, which we have just raised to 9%. And we have powerful reasons for doing so, which have been extensively debated. Our spending needs have gone up, especially for healthcare and the aging population. And we know that we will need the money sooner rather than later. Why do we do this? It's not just for the fun of it. Nobody relishes a tax increase. Not even the Ministry of Finance, 
Why should a government volunteer unnecessarily to do something which it knows is going to be unpopular? But if it has to be done, we will do it. And that it is what it means to take responsibility for governing our country. We got here because of the careful tending of our forefathers. Despite the difficulties and the challenges which they faced, they still put savings aside so that we can enjoy this resource today. And we are that much better off for it and grateful to them for it. Now, we too should fulfil our obligation to our children and grandchildren to protect their interest in this nest egg. This nest egg, it's the money of the people of Singapore, yes, but it is not the money only of this generation of the people of Singapore. It belongs to this generation, it belongs to future generations too, and we have a re responsibility to both. And if we fulfil that responsibility in time, our children and grandchildren too can benefit from a steady stream of returns from the reserves and also have an umbrella to protect them come a rainy day. We must not erode the patrimony, this family treasure, which we have inherited from our forefathers, nor should we burden future generations with debt, nor mortgage their future. We are beneficiaries of our forefathers' sacrifice and vision, but we are also trustees protecting this inheritance for future generations. It is not just for us, and we have a responsibility to our children and grandchildren. This is the ethos and the compact which generations of Singaporeans have forged and it is one that, in fact, has been upheld across the aisle in this House. During the global financial crisis, I spoke about it briefly just now, we brought forward the FY 2009 budget to deal with the crisis, and we had a crisis budget. In the budget, this is a budget where we had the job support scheme and we drew four we were going to draw $4.9 billion from the past reserves. And in the budget debate, Mr. Lo Tiakyang questioned why the government wanted to draw down on past reserves instead of using savings from the government's current budget. And he said, past reserves, no, let's read it again. He said, what is unusual of our resilience package is that the government will be using our past reserves to fund two main components of the package, the jobs credit scheme and the special risk sharing initiative. I think I misspoke. I said job support scheme. It's a jobs credit scheme. Past reserves are a strategic asset meant for use in times of need, especially when the government faces financial constraints due to unprecedented circumstances which require the government to respond in the interest of the nation. Hence, I am surprised that the government has chosen to set a precedent in asking the president for approval for a drawdown of our past reserves when it has enough savings from the current term of government to fund the entire resilience package and the resulting budget deficit, which the finance minister has estimated at a certain amount. So it was a very reasonable question, actually it's a very polite objection, and it was right that he raised it and we debated it. And our answer was, we are doing this so that we have dry powder. And there are current reserves, we may well need it later. We put that aside. If we need to, we will use it. As it turned out, fortunately, we didn't need to. Two years later, in 2011, when the government paid the $4 billion back to the past reserves, Mr. Lo spoke again. He did the honourable thing and commended the government. And he said in the budget debate again, 2011, in conclusion, sir, the budget this year has done one thing right. 
it has prudently put back into past reserves the $4 billion that the government took in 2009. So this is how a responsible opposition conducts itself. There was a common commitment to safeguard our past reserves because and a recognition, shared recognition, that they are a strategic asset only to be used for unprecedented circumstances. Now, I hear the opposition arguing that we should change the rules and draw more from reserves, and that, of course, they have no intention to raid the reserves, far from wanting to bankrupt Singapore. They say we can easily afford what they are proposing. I conclude that tune has changed. May I remind them that the changes they are proposing are not simply policy changes, but require amending the Constitution to draw and to spend more from past reserves, which are protected by the President. Some people say it's harder for this generation to abide by the same tight fiscal rules as before. They say that now growth is slower, the cost of living has gone up, which is true. But our forefathers, who put aside the surpluses which grew into the reserves, were much less well-off than us, to put it bluntly, much poorer than us. Our standard of living is double or triple what our forefathers lived with. And yet, they saved up surpluses for the future, whereas now we hear arguments that we should draw more from the reserves on the basis that we need the money more urgently today. There's a Chinese saying, Chuang ye nan, shou ye geng nan, bai jia qing er yi ju. Hard to start, even harder to keep it going, but all too easy to ruin and to lose everything. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and his team had anticipated this outcome, this political pressure. They knew that there would always be many worthy, heart-tugging causes demanding government resources. Every MP has got pet causes which he champions. Even ministers have pet causes. Even prime ministers are allowed to have a few. We all want more things to be done. But we also know, and Mr. Lee know, knew, that money would always be not enough. And he knew that it would always be politically tough to raise taxes, and that's why he and his colleagues designed and implemented the two-key scheme. Some of Mr. Lee's senior colleagues told him that in locking up the reserves, he was trying the impossible. Trying the impossible. You know why? Because their philosophy was, if a generation wants to spend the money, somehow they'll get their hands on it and they will do it. But Mr. Lee disagreed and decided he had to try his best. And it's up to us and for us now to prove that we can protect the nest egg and that Singaporeans are capable of being prudent and responsible well beyond the founding generation. We are not asyakya. We are responsible. We are also forefathers one day of generations yet to be born. The government is elected not just to take care of citizens today, but also to secure the future of the country and the PAP government has always done both. But in taking care of today's citizens, we are very conscious to safeguard the interests of young people not yet voting, future citizens not yet born, and the long-term interests of Singapore. In 2001, when we instituted the 50% rule applied to NII, and amended the Constitution, Mr. Lee intervened in the debate because some MPs were proposing good causes to spend the money on. 
particularly old people. And he reminded everyone in Parliament, he said, at the end of the day, whom do we owe our deepest obligation to as a government? To the future. Not just to the president, not just to the present, certainly not to the past. We must protect the past reserves. It's our precious resource, our strategic advantage. It's a great source of comfort and reassurance that if we run into a jam or find ourselves in a tight spot, which is bound to happen every so many years and not so many years, we will have one extra card to play. We will not be destitute. Other countries admire, even envy what we have, but they find it very hard to emulate what we have done. It was only in Singapore, only in those circumstances, only with that history and that generation and that phase of nation building that we could do it. If it's gone, we will not be able to do it again either. So therefore, as for ourselves, we too must make a conscious effort to keep our system working. Singaporeans need to have the right instincts. Save when we can, resist the pressure to touch it, use only when we really must. Each of us must see ourselves as stewards and trustees, taking care of the interests of present and future generations. That's the way to keep this discipline, to keep this rule, and to keep this system with two keys working well. Ultimately, in a democracy like Singapore, on big issues like this, it is the people who will decide. And the PAP is convinced that this is the right approach for Singapore. As long as the PAP government is in power, this is what we will do. If any other political party thinks that this is not the right approach, if they truly believe that we should dip into our reserves more, then bring it to the ballot box. Put it up front. Say you want to touch, you want to spend. You want to shift the rules. Don't pretend that we are just being, you are being just as prudent, only more kind-hearted. Campaign in the next general election on this issue. Ask voters for a mandate to form the government, change the constitution, dismantle the second lock and key. Put this squarely to the people and let them decide. The PAP will join issue with them and convince Singaporeans that our way is the right way for Singapore. And I believe Singaporeans believe us. Because if I may come back to the IPS survey which we referred to and which you still have in your hands, it was not just a survey of the trust for input on reserves and therefore trust in the PAP government in general. If you look at the paragraph under page under para 3.3, it says, in the case of the PAP government, the statement was modified to refer to the level of trust in it to manage the reserves. In other words, Singaporeans have high confidence in the PAP government's management of the reserves. And therefore, we are confident that we will win the argument and we'll be able to get Singaporeans to do the right thing. Taking a long-term view of the reserves, striking the right balance between present and future needs, these are vital responsibilities of any Singapore government. I have spent 40 years of my life stewarding, safeguarding, improving this system, continuing the work of those who had come before me. Now I'm preparing to hand over to my successor, in good order, a Singapore which is more prosperous, more secure. I ask everyone to help them maintain the prudent policies that have served us well, to keep Singapore on the right track so that we can all continue to benefit from the nation's success for many years to come. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.